The peace of the Lord be with you. And good morning and welcome to everyone. Um, we actually have a, a few announcements before we start this morning. Um, I've got a, a pastor's conference this week, so we will not be having Wednesday Bible class. Uh, we'll be having it the, the next week, so join us then. But this Wednesday, May 18th, we will not be having it. Um, also, Terry is out of the office this week, and uh, she'll be back in, in the office next Monday. Um, with me being at the conference Tuesday and Wednesday, if you have any needs, feel free to leave a message or, or call me on my cell or whatnot. So, uh, but, but Terry will not be in the office during that time. Next Sunday, uh, we are going to have our inter intergenerational Sunday. It's the, the last Sunday of Sunday school, so we'll be doing the, the inter intergenerational Sunday in the uh, in, in the fellowship hall. We invite everyone to join us for that. So uh, please, please please feel free to do so. And then uh, that'll be immediately following the service. Then at 5 p.m. also we will have our uh, a, a youth gathering, a youth gathering, a youth event, and invite all Sunday school families to, to join us. Join us for that. We'll be having hot dogs on Sundays. So, uh, and actually, I think Jessica's going to put together a uh, uh, sign-up genius for that. So, look, look for that in your email as well, please. Uh, and then that's that's next Sunday, next Monday. We will also have the last women's club meeting uh, before they take a break for the summer at 1 p.m. So, ladies, join them for that. And then we'll have a men's group meeting that night at 7 p.m. So, men, join us for that. Um, Let's see here. Then, like I guess we got a few, quite a few here. Uh, then we also will be uh, looking at our, our summer book reading. This summer we're going to read Mere Christianity. So there are sign-up sheets if you'd like to join us for that. Uh, if, you, if you don't know Mere Christianity, that's written by, by C.S. Lewis, the author of the, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. You know, wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And it's kind of a, a great explanation of the, of the Christian faith. So it kind of talks about his own conversion from... From being an atheist and, and becoming a Christian and what that what that means. So anyway, we'll be reading that in June, July, and August. So please join us for that. And like I said, sign up sheets for the book are in the narthex and in the kitchen. Uh, speaking of the kitchen, if you want to join us for for cupcakes after the service, there are cupcakes here. Mark Wren, uh, I, I think you all know Mark, or many of you do. Uh, his his granddaughter was baptized. Oh, wait, I think it's grand. I'm drawing a blank. Is it granddaughter or grandson? I should know. It's a boy. It's a boy. They're blue. That should have been a clue. Yeah. It is, it's a boy. Okay. I'm, I'm embarrassed. I should, have, I should have remembered that. Yeah. So his grandson was baptized yesterday, and um, they had some extra cupcakes, and they want us to join in the celebration of that baptism. So, so please feel free to grab some of those there in the, in the kitchen. And then um, last but not least, the, uh, for the planning committee, we are planning on having our meeting Thursday at 2. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's in the, um, yeah, it's not in the calendar in here, and it's not on the calendar. Uh, I, I forgot to make sure that we had it on those. So planning committee, please join us at 2. We're going to take time and walk around the, uh, the, the buildings and facilities here and, uh, and do an assessment. So please join us for that. All right. I think that's it. Unless does anybody else have anything they want to put out there? Um, all right, our opening hymn uh, for this morning is hymn 556. Dear Christians, one and all rejoice. Hymn 556. We'll sing stanzas one and two and four and five, and we'll sing those after the feeling of the vow.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have not done. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence. As a call and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Give the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. He turned the sea into a land. They passed through the river of the There did we rejoice in him. He rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Bless our God, the peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Glory be to the Father.
desire of the promise. That among the many changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament lesson for this, the fifth Sunday of Easter, is from the twelfth chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitants of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from the letter of James, the first chapter. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for our Lord's words in the Holy Gospel. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated for our hymn of the day, number 523, the Word of God incarnate, in 523.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we meditate on the Gospel lesson which was previously read. But now I am going to Him who sent me, and none of you asks me where are you going, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Well, the idea that Jesus' disciples would be filled with sorrow upon hearing these words that he speaks there shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, after all, if someone that you have loved has told you that they can no longer be in your presence, I'm sure sorrow filled your own heart, and you know that sorrow. Of course, as I say that, there are varying degrees. For example, when I left to go to the Holy Land for those two weeks I was gone, or almost two weeks, my family and I had sorrow that we would not see each other for that time. and There were even some tears shed, but we trusted that the distance, or the time for that distance would not be all that long. And so that sorrow is all the more severe when it's something that is longer, when it's something like a, a romantic partner breaking up a relationship, or it's most severe and it's worst and saddest when a beloved family member receives a terminal diagnosis, then those words from that person or from the doctor reflect most closely what Jesus describes as He speaks of going to the Father. Those words saying, I'm here now, but I soon won't be and will not see each other as a result of that. The knowledge that that person is no longer going to be in our presence is devastating isn't it? So, imagine the sorrow that these disciples felt. There's this concern that this teacher for whom they've given up everything to follow will no longer be present with them. And in fact, think about that sorrow all the more in view of what their expectations would have been at that time. As I say this, right, we're, we're hearing these words in the season that's after the resurrection. But they weren't. Things weren't still clear for them. These words were spoken by Jesus on the night before He was betrayed. So they don't know about the death and resurrection. They don't know all these things. Jesus even speaks about that when He says that there are these things that they cannot yet bear. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will declare to you the things that are to come. You see this being before the death and the resurrection of Jesus. These disciples are still in the mindset that Jesus is, yes, the Messiah, but as the Messiah, He is this King who's going to bring about an earthly kingdom. He's going to bring about the restoration of the kingdom of Israel to earth. He's going to free them from the Romans. He's going to establish this kingdom of David in the location of of the earthly Jerusalem. In fact, as Jesus was with those disciples on that night, the Bible tells us that they had been staying that week in the Mount of Olives, which was just east of Jerusalem. And tradition says that that night, they were in fact in the city right by the temple. Right by where David himself had lived as king. You can imagine then as the, the proceedings of that week are, are flashing in their mind as he's saying this, you, you can picture them imagining Jesus riding down that Mount of Olives from, to the east of Jerusalem, riding into the temple, right? And as he's doing that, they're imagining the celebration of his kingship that went along with that. They're picturing him as this king of the city. They're picturing the, the glory that Israel will have. I can imagine that they're picturing it like we so often think the, the U.S. ought to be like. A, a land of freedom. A land of abundance. Most importantly, a land of faithfulness to God's design for the world. And in fact, you see that not only in how they respond now, but in the fact that as Jesus even is about to ascend to heaven in the book of Acts that we'll have with the ascension here in a couple of weeks, that, that even then they're asking when Jesus is going to establish this kingdom. 
they have on their minds these sorts of utopia, these sorts of things going along with that earthly kingdom. So you can imagine then that when Jesus says He's no longer going to be in their presence, how that would crush them. Can you imagine that the, the first thought on their mind would be that I'm leaving you and that will be beneficial? I don't imagine that at all. In fact, as I connected this to our own experiences of knowing that we will be distant, distanced from our own loved ones, I imagine their hearts sank. I can imagine them saying, what do you mean you're not going to be here with us? What do you mean you're going to the One who sent you? Of course, sorrow is filling my heart. How is this going to be to my advantage? And that, that's exactly what Jesus says. It is to your advantage that I go away. And why is it to their advantage? Because if He doesn't go, the Helper won't come. And who is the Helper? Well, he says it later, the Spirit of Truth. The Helper is the Holy Spirit. What Jesus is telling His disciples is that as He ascends, as He goes away, this is good because this means that He will send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will clarify in their hearts all the things that they don't understand. In fact, we see Jesus talk about this elsewhere in John in this, this discourse that we have here. It's kind of referenced here, but we see it elsewhere. He says that the Spirit will clarify for them, bring to their remembrance all the things that Jesus has said. With that, it will become clear what Jesus' life, what His death, what His resurrection were for. It will become clear what Jesus meant when He said things like the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill Him and He will be raised on the third day. It will become clear that this thing with the Kingdom of God isn't about creating a utopic reign here and now, but instead bringing the Kingdom of God now is to distribute that grace of God to a broken and fallen world. And that this Kingdom of God comes so that those who suffer in this world might be taken to a new creation. A creation where suffering is no more. Most importantly, where that sin that distances us, that has broken in creation, where that sin is not present to interfere with an, an even greater presence with that Lord Jesus than what those disciples knew on that night. And it's in view of that that Jesus says exactly what the Spirit is going to do. He says that the Spirit will come and He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in Me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see Me no longer. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. You see, the Spirit is going to come to reveal to people their sin. He's going to convict the world of their sin. In fact, whenever you yourselves feel that conviction, you can thank the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, as I say that, you might be thinking, well, I think I'd rather have Jesus sitting right in front of me than have that feeling that I get with that. Because conviction doesn't feel good, does it? But think about what that conviction does for you. Think about the times that that conviction has prevented you from doing something really awful. Think about the times that that conviction has prevented you from succumbing to your basest desires when doing so would have been ruinous to your life. About the times that that conviction was sensed by you and you realized that the draw to sin isn't going to be the flashy, attractive thing that the devil likes it to make it out to be in temptation. When you think about it like that, that conviction is not so bad, is it? 
But even as I say that, is that all that this conviction is really about? No. In fact, think of the even greater purpose that conviction serves. Think about what that conviction does to you when you've already fallen prey to temptation. After all, I'm, I'm guessing you all know that experience when, when the devil dangles that temptation in front of you and makes you think that it will be so pleasing and that the sin really isn't that bad after all. And, and so you give in. And then you give in, and what happens? Guilt. Shame. Regret. And what does that serve? Well, the devil wants to use that. And he wants to use it to drive you further from God, that you would be driven into despair and delusion. But think about how the Holy Spirit uses it. Have you ever felt that conviction and it made you look forward to being here on Sunday morning? It made you look forward to hearing those words, I forgive you your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever experienced that conviction and it, and it brought you then to tears as you tasted the body of Christ and his blood shed for you, for your forgiveness? I know I've seen some of you in those tears at times at this rail. And it's a joy for me as a pastor. And I don't say that because it's a joy for me to see you in sorrow. Obviously not. But it's a joy because I, what I see in that is the knowledge of how this gift of God, how the promise of His forgiveness and life and salvation is reaching into the depths of your hearts. Because you see, that's what Jesus says the Spirit will also give. As He says this, He says, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will, he will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Yeah, the Spirit convicts you of sin, but he also guides you into truth. He also speaks to you what is Christ's. And what is that? It is that very kingdom. It is that forgiveness of sins that Jesus won for you on the cross, that your sins would be forgiven. And the Spirit speaks that into your ears. He feeds that to you on your tongues. And He does this that you could know for certain that this blood shed on the cross is for you. It's for your sin. It's even for that one sin that haunts you when you give yourself time for peace and quiet to reflect on it. And what you find in this is that the Spirit is actually bringing Jesus Himself to you. Bringing Jesus and His work to you. You see, it was to the disciples' advantage that Jesus go to the Father because that way, Jesus could be present with them in a different fashion. He could be present with them as they all went out and proclaimed this blessed Gospel to the world. He could be present with Peter as Peter went to Rome. He could be present with Thomas, as tradition tells us that Thomas went the opposite direction to India. He could be present with the writer of this Gospel, with John, as John was in Ephesus, and also in Patmos in his exile. He could be present with those who weren't even at that table, with, with Mark, who tradition says went to Egypt, with Paul, as he went to Asia Minor, to Greece, to Rome, even maybe to Spain. Who was with them all by that Spirit? Jesus. And now who is able to be with you by that same Spirit? Jesus. Jesus who ascends and now fills all things by this Spirit that He has sent is able then to be with you. You know, as I describe the conviction of that Spirit and the relief of that forgiveness, Christians, I pray that you realize how present Christ is with you because He has gone to be with the Father. 
And I don't mean just in an ethereal presence, right? Yeah, it's nice when we know that Jesus is all around us. It's nice, especially in those times where we can feel that presence as it warms our hearts with His comfort and His peace. But the greatest thing you can be sure of is His presence not just sort of in a general way, but that He is present here in a very unique way. Present with His forgiveness in His Word, in water, in His body and blood. Because after all, warm feelings come and go. But the promises of God never fail. So as you experience sorrow and conviction for your sin, as you experience the hardships and the the tribulation that come in a sin-fallen world, I want you to have the assurance in what the Spirit gives to you. Know that He gives you what is Christ's. Know that in His presence, Christ is present with you. Know that Christ, in that presence of the Spirit, is bringing with you His eternal kingdom won for you by the shedding of His precious blood. Know that He is with you even in the depth of your sin. Yes, it was to your advantage that He go to the one who sent Him. It was to your advantage so that you can know that He is with you now. And what greater promise is there than that? Amen. And may the peace of that promise guard your hearts and your minds in faith in Christ Jesus and to life in His everlasting kingdom.